So I'm going to invite you now to look into your magic crystal ball. And uh, I'm going to ask you what you think the uh, future holds for you with regards to your career and lifestyle. I don't really feel like I need to have the answers. I feel like what I need to have is the questions. Are you ready? All right. Welcome to the Remote Work and Travel Show. I'm your host, Nora Dunn, aka The Professional Hobo. And in this series, I speak with ordinary people who have extraordinary travel lifestyles and remote careers to get the real dirt on what it's like. Now, if you've been watching this series for long, first of all, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for subscribing, for hitting the little bell, for mashing the buttons, doing the likes and all the things. Thank you for being here. But if you have been watching this series, you will also notice that I interview a wide variety of people from a wide variety of backgrounds. Nobody has the same career. Nobody has the same travel lifestyle. And quite frankly, that's what I'm really happy to show you is that there are as many different iterations of the travel lifestyle and travel related careers as there are people doing them. And my guest today is no exception. She is Rachel Redwall. As an Emmy-nominated on-camera host, producer, camera operator, writer, and photographer, Rachel Redwall has traveled all seven continents, lived in three countries, and journeyed through nearly 70 nations. Rachel loves dropping herself into faraway lands to relate their stories to outsiders. In fact, she does such a good job of it that she was recently named an Explorers Club Fellow alongside greats like Buzz Aldrin and Sir Edmund Hillary. Rachel's had countless global adventures, ranging from TV hosting for Travel Channel's Epic Lists and HLN's Vacation Chasers, to digital hosting for Time, Inc. and Taste Made, and from brand content creation for BMW and Chase Bank, to producing shows like Ice Road Truckers and Axemen. Beyond the screen, Rachel writes articles and shoots photography for magazines like Afar and Forbes, and shares further global inspiration through speaking, keynote addresses, and conference workshops. Rachel has worked in every stage of media production, from development and pre-pro to field and post, and is skilled with varied editing systems, digital cameras and gear, drones included. Her audience spans over 300,000 adventurous souls around the world, and as a result of her extensive travel experience, Rachel has been a featured expert for Travel and Leisure, Forbes, Mary Claire Magazine, Time, and many more. Thank you, and welcome to the show, Rachel. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. I feel like listening to that, I expected like very small trumpets. Like, we should, I should, I should, I should, I should cue in like audience, like, um, ah. yeah, yeah. Like someone, there are people who are dressed as knights and bards and people are singing and a very small <laughs> trumpet. All right, you went the Renaissance Fair route. I went the <laughs> audience stadium route. I think between the two of us, we're definitely going to make this work. <laughs> yeah, love it. That's the stadium. So just drop that audio in anytime you need to sound like there's cheering. I like it. I like it. We might work that into this uh, into this episode <laughs> for you here. Um, and so I actually first met you in person. We were both speaking at Women's Travel Fest. And to be perfectly honest, when I first met you in person, I was more than a little tongue tied. I because I, you've done so many amazing things. Uh, both in and outside of the TV business, but you and I do share the TV business in common. We both have decades of experience working in the business in front of and uh, behind the camera. But frankly, your resume just absolutely blows mine out of the water. I mean, I'm a, and and that was I'm, I'm envious. I'm I and I just I hold you in great esteem, which is why I'm so glad to have you here today. But Thank I would you. love to start with how did you how did you do this? I mean, how did you learn everything that you know about television and develop this career? Because this is an enviable thing, but I also recognize it's a ton of work. And I'm curious how you got started and how it evolved for you. It's a lot of work. There are so many things that seem super glamorous. And then if you actually learn about them, you're like, mm, maybe <laughs> yeah, not. This is what I signed up for. <laughs> Maybe not. Yeah, I'm I'm originally from the Midwest in the US. I'm I'm from Ohio. And I when I was in like grade school, high school, I was like, you know, wow, there's a world out there. I'd like to go there sometime. <laughs> and so when I went to college, I was studying international relations, foreign languages. I thought that the way that I might get to see and participate in said world would be if I were a diplomat. 
maybe. And um, that was the only thing I really knew about or the Peace Corps program. Long and short, I ended up getting a, an internship between my junior and senior years of college with a travel company. And they sent me around the world to 16 countries over three months in order to create media assets that would inspire others to travel. So it was a dream job. And at the time, because it was an internship, it wasn't paid. And I was like, this is the best job ever. I was thinking like, I'll do this for my whole life and just never get paid. Seems fine. Um, Alas, (laughs) rent money becomes important. So (laughs) I I decided, yeah, super surprising. I, I ended up going back to that final year of college and deciding maybe I could work as a storyteller. I didn't know if that was a thing, but I was like, there are shows on PBS that are travel shows, public broadcasting. Um, So I I learned all I could in that last year of school uh, about what it would look like to actually work in media production. I determined that LA was a really good city to get into that universe and to work my way up from the bottom of the the food chain. I started as a production assistant on shows that are docu-series that I eventually became producer shooter on and things like that. But yeah, started at the bottom and and was putting post-its on office walls for people getting coffee, taking calls, doing all the stuff that you got to start out doing. And gradually I was learning from people who are very good storytellers, right? So I was learning by watching and learning by doing and learning by sitting in on meetings. And eventually those people that I looked up to started giving me opportunities to, to produce and to work behind the camera. And so uh, from there, I worked behind the camera for many years in the field, in post-production. Then I started doing on-camera work, especially in the era of digital media. That's something that really democratized the process for all of us. So I started to be like, cool. Well, if I don't have my own show, I could produce it. I could put it on YouTube. I could put it on Facebook, see what happens. And um, so I was kind of doing these things concurrently where I was producing other people's shows and I was learning and I was getting better and better. And then I was also doing my own as a side hustle, which is incredibly common nowadays. You've just touched upon, I mean, I have a list of questions. I I usually pre-prepare questions and you've just touched on like the next four questions I have for you. I don't even know where to go from here, except, (laughs) right? I mean, thank you and goodbye. Um, <laughs> Wait, hold on. Is this an opportunity for <sighs> crowd goes wild? Does the crowd, does the crowd go wild? That's it. The crowd point? just went wild. We made yeah. that happen. I know it. <laughs> Great. So first of all, you and I, again, we share more commonalities in that you and I both learned on the job. So I had an internship in high school and I was looking for something in a theater. I I was a a professional actor, singer, dancer. I was going to a performing arts high school. I thought I'm going to do something in a theater, like stage management or something. My co-op teacher comes back to me and says, don't have anything at a theater, but I got this TV station that they take, they take co-op students. Uh, Do you want to try it out? I'm like, well, that's not really what I was looking for, but eh, all right. And of course it was life-changing for me. I was, you know, I started off hosting a segment of a show and then I learned the the ropes of, you know, segment producing and then camera and editing. And it was actually a studio that was retrofitted to be able to teach people the business. So I learned it from the inside out. And then like you, I went to a major network and uh, with a chip on my shoulder, the size of Timbuktu, which was unfortunate. (laughs) Because in the TV business, as you well know, regardless of your experience, when you start in on a new place, you do start at a lower level. And I wasn't prepared for that. So um, I had a couple of not so nice things happen to me politically within the TV business. But going back these years, I think this is a very antiquated story, right? The story of how you get into traditional network television, I think it, it doesn't work that way anymore. And you mentioned the, you know, now that digital media is a thing, there are different ways to get into this business. So from your experience over the years, how has the television and video production business changed and evolved for better or worse? I think a lot more people can get into storytelling because gear is accessible and gear can include things like your cell phone, right? So our phones record beautiful high definition video. If you're listening in and you're like, I really want to get into this world, but I don't have the funds to go buy expensive cameras and stuff like that. That's fine. You don't need to. You just start by starting. You start with what you have. You can go out, you can record stuff with your phone, practice editing on things like reels or TikTok, get a sense for how to tell stories in a punchy way. 
And that's social media centric first and foremost, but go from there, right? You can just start by playing digital media, as well as the fact that gear is much more cost effective now, or it it isn't cost prohibitive means that anybody can be a storyteller and making the leap to TV might still sound interesting and enticing, but I would actually say you can reach a lot more people generally online because there's no barrier to entry. People are able to see what you're putting out in the world. If you're putting it on a YouTube, if you're putting it on social media, whereas if somebody wants to watch a TV show, they've got to have like a paid package where they're streaming or they're getting getting it on their TV. Right. So the funny thing is a lot of these TV shows that I hosted or that I produced, it it would excite people to hear about them. They'd be like, this is so amazing. It's TV. And then I'd be like, here's the day that it's on. And here's the time. And people would be like, I really wish I could watch. I don't have a, I don't have cable. So both avenues of reaching people through social media, through streaming, and through television are great methods, depending on what interests you. Certainly you can get a lot of clout by working on TV projects. You also get great experience. You learn from people who are really good at storytelling, but you don't have to, if you'd like to reach people online, both are available to you. And you're absolutely right. I have, uh, in recent years, I actually have had a couple of ideas for TV shows that I don't, I think they're pretty good. And anyone I've spoken to thinks they're pretty good, but for lack of a production company to back the idea and come in and do the things, uh, so I could just birth the idea and host the show, which is all I really wanted to do. Well, of course, that's not really possible anymore. So people said to me, oh, Nora, just do it, do the show yourself, right? Self-produce it, do it, put it on YouTube. And, yeah. and I have seen people who will do exactly that, right? They learn all the ropes, they create their own content, they self-produce, they're on YouTube. And in some cases, if they excel at their art, they get picked up by networks, uh, be they streaming networks or uh, traditional cable networks. So it does seem like that is a viable entry into the business in a way that that formerly, I mean, decades ago, that was not the case. And you're exactly right. I actually, the first show that I hosted for a major network was because of a YouTube series that I had. So I was producing on these shows that were on other networks and I was behind the camera But then I had that side hustle where I was producing content for YouTube and it was my own content. I was producing it with a partner and she and I would co-host, co-produce, co-edit, do the whole thing. Right. And we were putting out one video per week and we were reaching a lot of eyeballs. And uh, there was a production company that reached out and said, hey, we have a a show format that has been greenlit, meaning it's it's funded. Uh, It's for this network called HLN, which is of the CNN universe, family, Mm -hmm. um, but lifestyle. They said, we're looking for hosts. We were looking for a male and female host, but you two have obviously been working together for a long time. You have an audience, you have built in chemistry. We'd love to see if you might be interested in hosting this show. So they found us because we had already built the thing, right? It wasn't our format. We didn't sell the show, but we sold ourselves as capable. And they were like, we, we love what you have. We'd like to plop you into this format and, and go from there. And we were like, yeah, great. Cause it's a travel show and we get to help other people travel. And that was the goal. Our series was travel. And so it was a really natural fit. What was the process of getting picked up from YouTube? Uh, how is it different than producing your own show and kind of going through the pitch process? Yeah. I have been through both sides and the, There are a couple of major differences. One is access. So people can find you online. I mean, it takes some, some luck, right? But they can find your work online. If you build an audience, a a unique voice and perspective, if you've built out something that maybe is a format that people haven't seen before, the people who are casting shows or picking up shows, there is the potential they find you online. If you're doing things the other way, where you have a show that you want to pitch to networks, one, there's the question of access. So can you get those pitch meetings? Uh, A lot of different networks will not accept unsolicited pitches. So you need to be working with an agency or a a management company or something like that in order to get a, a meeting in the first place. The other thing is capital. It takes a lot of money to produce what is called a sizzle reel or the initial video format. That's like, here's your three to seven minute proof of concept video. And it used to be 
that you could sell a show with what's called a one sheet. It's got like, you know, here's the title of the show. Here's the log line, which is like the general theme. And then this is what an episode or a couple episodes might look like. Or you could pitch with a pitch deck, which would be a longer version. But nowadays people want to see a visual proof of concept. It's easier for them to visualize. Um, it's definitely, it doesn't require as much imagination on the parts of the decision makers. So I think it's also probably perceived as lower risk where they go, look, we already have the, it, look, we can tell it looks great. We don't have to envision it. We're not taking a big risk. It's easier to fund if people can see that. So access the financials to back a project like that, to produce and shoot and then edit something like that. Um, it can be that those are pretty high barriers to entry. And there's definitely no guarantee of selling the thing because there are at a bigger production company, entire development teams who have financial backing from networks or just from their own organization. And then they also have the, the number of people who can go out and shoot sizzle reels all day, do research online, be like, here's a cool concept. What if we did this? So if you're pitching your own thing and it's a one-off and you really hope to get it sold, there are also companies that are pitching like 50 shows a year, you know? So, um, building a thing online, building your own series that you're really excited about can serve as proof of concept. And you can always go kind of like the backdoor route and try to find people who work at various production companies and things like that and be like, hey, I have a concept that that really seems to fit the other programming that you produce. Um, worst case scenario, you don't want to hear back. So that's really great advice, though, to use the YouTube as a way of a demonstrating proof of concept that you can then take. So you don't have to just do your show and sit back and wait for someone to approach you and say, hey, uh, you know, we want to we want to take pick you up. You, there is a, a process that you can do. Is there anything else that you would advise to someone who is looking to create their own show or create a show that gets picked up? I, I'd also like to just acknowledge for a second here that that is a lot of work to self-produce a show on YouTube. Like, I feel like all the people who said, oh, just self-produce and put it on YouTube. They, they were talking about it like it's nothing, but it is a lot of work. Yeah. And uh, although I oh, understand and respect the fact that proof of concept is necessary, it's kind of a cart and horse thing. Like if we take this to the traditional, this is a tangent, tangent, everybody. If we compare it to the traditional publishing industry, it's the same thing. A publisher is not going to pick you up as a writer for your book, unless you can demonstrate that you already have the audience. But, you know, in the olden days, the publisher was the one that got you the audience. So it seems like we now as creators, now we have to do a lot of that legwork that formerly was done by publishing houses or production companies. So it's definitely a different environment. Back to my question. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. Back <laughs> to my question. And that is, do you have any advice for anyone who is looking to get into the business in a similar way in this current climate? Look for a unique hook. Your pitch has to be different. So in my case, because I have produced and hosted content in the travel world, just a travel show won't sell. A person traveling and eating things, that's been done a million times. There are all these formats that have been great, and then they've been done so many times that it's no longer unique. So you have to have something that really sets you apart, either as an individual with a point of view as the person who's on camera or as a format in general, ideally both. It has to be something that you haven't seen anywhere else if your goal is to sell this, to have other people watch. If you just want to do a general travel format and you want to produce it for yourself because that's fun for you, awesome. I did that a lot of the time too, where I kept producing my own digital content well after the HLN show because I was like, this is a brilliant way to get to know a place always. And I had a show, a subsequent series where I had my audience vote and I'd say, okay, I'm going to such and such place. What do you want to see me do? And I'd have them vote via a poll. And my audience would tell me what I was doing next. And then I would get to shoot a video about it. I swam in Antarctica because of it. I ate all kinds of crazy things because of it. That was my format, my unique hook. It worked really well for those multiple years that we were having that conversation as a creator and an audience. And I loved it. And you had a lifestyle because you had all these shows and you had this very travel lifestyle. As I understand it, you were actually proverbially homeless for quite some time. I don't think you had an actual home. You just had a storage space because you were always on the road with shows. How was that? What was that like as a lifestyle? 
for me, it worked. It was exciting. I was early enough in my career that I didn't have a whole lot tying me down. And I did have a storage unit while I would go back and forth between projects in different places, a lot of projects in remote corners of Alaska. So I'd fly up, I'd be in the field for three months, and then I'd come home and home would be, I'd check my PO box. I would go to the storage unit and I would repack from like my winter Arctic gear to like my summer Carhartt. Uh, Alaska gear and and then and you're definitely not allowed to like live in your storage unit but I'd spend many an hour repacking and I feel like that's fair and then I would crash on a friend's couch or whatever it was and I'd go back out in the field um that for me worked really well because I didn't have rent to pay I didn't have reasons that I needed to be returning to to a you know, quote unquote home base, other than to repack, maybe say hi to some friends, and then I could go have more adventures. Were there any, and it sounds like it, it was an ideal fit for you. Did you feel like you were any, making any sacrifices and not having a home in a home base? At that time, I didn't really feel like I was making sacrifices because I feel like it was exactly what I wanted to be doing. I was like, this is the best. I'm having adventures. I mean, I wasn't like dating or anything, but I also didn't really feel like that was a major concern. Um, and this is, you know, early to mid twenties. I was just like, this is, you know, I get to explore. This is the jam. Uh, being on the shows that I was on, it was like, I wasn't having to pay for my own groceries because we had to have a per diem because we had to be in the Arctic and they, you know, it was like the show was going to feed us. Not that there were as many grocery options, but <laughs> they had to pay for it as, as our employers. So it was a great way for me to have adventures, to not have a, a huge financial commitment back in this city that, that housed my, you know, my mail and my um, suitcases. Later, it became clear that it was more exciting for me to have a home base and continue to travel from there. Which brings me, again, it's perfect. It's like I gave you the play card and, and you knew exactly <laughs> where I was going to go with this. Um, actually, before I go to the next question, how many years were you proverbially homeless while uh, filming shows? So I was two years with a storage unit, okay. just in motion, living adventure. And then, well, that's a good question. I mean, and in, in university too, I was always, I kept leaving and coming back. I would like, go study abroad, come back, go study abroad, come back, go study abroad, come back. So it's one of those things where sometimes you'll hear people nowadays who are in, in motion enough that they're like, I've moved 18 times in two years. I felt like I was that person before I just committed to the storage unit and then got an apartment. Got it. Okay. And I, I feel like the transitional point for you was uh, meeting your now husband. Is that correct? Is that, is that when your lifestyle started changing a little bit? Yes, yeah, sort of. Um, we actually met during a study abroad in college. We started dating a couple years later when he was, he happened to be living in Alaska and I kept getting sent up there for work and the male female ratio was in my favor. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you happen to be, We happened to be single. I was like, hello and greetings. What are your thoughts? Should we be involved? And it was like, um, you know, the the joke about Alaska is um, the odds are good, but the goods are odd. <laughs> so I was like, hello, I'm Very odd. Good. What are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, Todd is my husband. He, I joke, like he ruined all my plans because I had these grand plans of just being in motion forever. And then it turns out I really like hanging out with him. So eventually we were like, okay, let's be in the same place. And so we got an apartment in California again, where a lot of the production happens in LA, he moved from his cabin in the woods with the outhouse to LA and we were living there. And I used that as a home base. And I started taking, um, kind of a mix of projects. So not just projects that would send me to places that were further afield, but also I'd work in post-production and I would be on the receiving end of getting all the footage from the field and, and editing and producing episodes of TV shows with an editor and, and working in the edit bay instead. So that I wasn't just like, thank you for moving here. Bye. <laughs> you know. All right. So that was a conscious decision then to shift the nature of your work uh, so it could accommodate your lifestyle of having a place and a partner and wanting to spend a little more time there. Yeah, totally. And Todd is somebody who has also always loved exploring an adventure and he has a normal human job. 
So the nine to five hours, but we also could very much align on when he was moving from Alaska to LA, we took three months to travel, for example, or when we go on vacations, we do like type two fun. People will be like, Oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm like really craving time on a beach and we're like, we're going to go hiking and it's going to be hard and dirty. (laughs) We're not going to have any fun. And they were like, that was the best. And people think we're strange. Um, so we are aligned on the way that we, that we want to use our time and our adventure funds and all of that as well. So obviously he also had then a job or the ability to move. Like, was he able to keep the same job and career moving from Alaska to California? No, so no. He had a pretty big uh, shift. You both really had a very big shift in your lifestyles. So you could be together. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, bless his parents. Cause they probably could not have felt very confident when he was like, I'm leaving a stable job in Alaska with a community. I love for a blonde in California. <laughs> Did you career suffer for it at all? Or do you feel like it was a natural evolution? Natural evolution. Great way to put it. I was able to learn the things that I needed to learn to become a better field producer, to become a better host. You are your best storyteller when you understand storytelling from varied perspectives. You're a better host if you've produced behind the camera. You're a better producer if you know what it's like to be a host. You're a better editor if you know what it's like to be in the field, because you know how challenging it is to get certain shots. So for me, this was a natural evolution that actually my mentor that I had worked with when I started out in production, he had expressed me really early on. He's like, I know you want to be in the field. I know you want to be a field producer and a camera operator. You're also going to have to come back sometime and work in the edit bay because it'll make you a better producer. He was like, you have to understand both sides. And he's 100% right. And I think that that has made me a much better storyteller. How did the pandemic change the landscape for you and your careers? Well, the world closed. I don't know if you heard. (laughs) But the world wasn't. Yeah, no, it was closed. It was not even open at all. (laughs) So all travel projects and all media productions, everything halted. So I was just like, well, I guess we're here now. (laughs) Um, And here now is Portland, Oregon. I had moved to Oregon, which is my husband's home state, like a few months before the pandemic. And so it was like, well, we will have so much time to get to know our home state, I guess. And I started working remotely and doing a lot more consulting, doing live events and things like that. Um, Live meaning virtual streaming live events. And yeah, just the, the very popular term of pivot, I pivoted to doing a lot more stuff like this, where it was like, these are, hello, are you in there? This is how, this is how we're doing things now. And, um, it was hard in all the expected ways beyond the vast and challenging difficulties of a pandemic, the the human toll, the professional toll was yeah, layered and took some getting used to. And now I feel a mix of both really excited about kind of entering the world again as it gradually opens. Mm -hmm. And like, that was a a fascinating reset. I have different skills now and I have a kind of renewed capacity to look at opportunities excitedly and be like, is this worth me saying yes? Or would I just say yes, because I felt I had to, because that's what I used to do. So what new skills did you end up learning that are, that you feel are going to serve you going forward as well? A lot more consulting, working both with individuals and corporate clients and taking some of the workshops and the public speaking and the formats that I would use to teach people in group contexts and doing a lot of one-on-one. I worked with a major TV network with their C-suite to train them to be better storytellers. That is not something that I would have foreseen. It's also not something that I probably would have gone after. I'd be like, sorry, I'm going to be in the jungle. (laughs) Can't accept that job. But it was a really fascinating way to take all the things that I've learned over many years and help other people step into their best storytelling selves, which I love. And I love working with individuals as well. People can come to me and be like, I'm a small business owner. I really understand that I need to, to home in on my brand or I, I really lack the confidence to sell myself, but I know that that's important because I'm selling a product or whatever it is. And they can reach out to me and say, can we work together? 
And I'm excited by that. I love that. What a fabulous way as well to take all of your experience and your skill sets and to the pandemic pivot, uh, you were able to pivot, take those skills, and then to be able to use them in a whole new way that is exciting and inspirational. And more importantly, fits your lifestyle a little better, or at least at the time, fit the pandemic a little bit better. But I also happen to know that during the pandemic, you did something else. You grew a baby. As you I like to grew say. a person. You which grew is a person. Wild. So there's another huge shift in your lifestyle. Uh, yeah. that, uh, you know, and I'm assuming that that has also shifted your career a little bit. I mean, how has that experience been from a career perspective and a lifestyle perspective? for you and Todd? Lifestyle changes. It probably won't surprise you to hear. (laughs) I'll answer the lifestyle question first. We are planning on doing all the things that we love with this tiny roommate we have and teaching him that the world is a really interesting place. So like by the time he was a month old, he was going on big hikes with us in a front pack and he's been snowshoeing and he's been on road trips and like, he's been to the ocean and swimming and all this stuff. Oh man. He, we now have a sunscreen for him. And then one of those dumb baby bucket hats, cause warmer weather's coming. I can't wait to have adventures to look back on where he's wearing this dumb hat bucket. hats. <laughs> They're really something. <laughs> So, uh, it has a lightning bolts on it, (sighs) special look. Um, so our plan is (laughs) to expose this person to the things that we love that are a part of our lives. And yeah, there are a lot of things that have to change to accommodate a small human, but we are of the impression and also the hope that he gets to join us in our lives and we don't just exist for him. Because he came here with a plan. He has a path. He knows what it's going to be. We don't. We don't have control over any of that. So all we can hope is that by sharing what we find to be beautiful and exciting, he'll find some things in there that he loves too. And he'll tell us, I like this. I don't like this. And we go from there. Yeah, so far so good. The only thing he doesn't really like is broccoli, which it's relatable because babies can't, you don't put like salt on things for babies and stuff and like unsalted, unbuttered broccoli everything else he loves adventure every food it's great we're never gonna look at broccoli um, the same way now you know that yeah you need to add it needs a little something it's true i mean it's good on its own it's good for you but would a baby like it theoretically might be a hard sell um babies eat so, a lot of things that i don't really like i mean all that mushed <laughs> and fruit and veggies i mean come on really i mean <laughs> you don't like your food pre-chewed that's really weird strangely no and and weird. Unseasoned. yeah weird <laughs> so so professionally yeah things change because i have a new sense of responsibility and opportunity to share time and experience with this very small roommate we have. What that means is sometimes I'm presented with professional um, opportunities where I go, my gut says that that's not right right now. And that's always been true, but there's a different factor involved, right? So in the past where I might've said, this doesn't feel right because fill in the blank. Now filling in the blank is like, I don't want to be away from the baby for that long. He's seven months old. He can't quite fend for himself yet. <laughs> like not he can't, quite. he's not old enough to like get a, job, get a job and move out or anything. So he still needs some um, interaction. And uh, an example of how the, the career shifts, I had an offer to produce a really awesome sounding travel science adventure show, which is 1000% like, hell yeah, my territory, love the idea. Um, and the baby was two months old yeah. and I was like, oh, it feels, it feels all kinds of wrong. The baby's so young. It's not like my husband and he wouldn't be fine, but I like that. I can trust instinct in moments like that. We all have the instinct, right? So there will be moments in all of our lives where it's like, Ooh, that feels wrong. Cause of some other choice I've made an, an obligation that I have, or am excited to have. So my little obligation, my tiny little friend, who's an obligation, I was excited to be able to say no to this thing because of him and be like, there's going to be somebody else who's a really good fit for this show. 
I really appreciate how you have more than once consciously designed and redesigned your life and your career. Uh, in some cases, because that was put upon you, because, you know, uh, there's that thing called a pandemic, it happened. Uh, we, none of us predicted that, right? Um, but in other ways, there were very conscious shifts that you made uh, for opportunities. Uh, for example, uh, you know, being with your husband, Todd, and yeah. changing your location so you could be together and shifting this, the, the nature of your work so you could be at home a little more often. And now the same thing. You've now consciously made a decision to have a tiny roommate uh, who is, I'm sure, enriching your life in, in many, many ways just necessitates you to make some different decisions, uh, but then also in so doing has created some opportunities. Like you said, when the pandemic started, you had no idea that there were, that you would move and you would pivot into the work that you're doing now, which is a lot more remote, flexible, uh, and, and really engaging and enriching in, in different ways. So I'm going to invite you now to look into your magic crystal ball. And uh, I'm going to ask you what you think the uh, future holds for you with regards to your career and lifestyle. Here's the crystal ball. Sorry, I forgot. It's supposed to look into it. So it's right here. You can visualize it. It's asking, that was kind of the size of a sandwich. I think I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> it is lunchtime. <laughs> um, what I feel clear on is that it's an okay time to not have the answers. Very nice. I'm somebody who has loved having a plan. Like this is followed by this, is followed by this. I loved having specific things to work toward. I mean, goals are great. They're motivators. Um, but I also tended to have a habit of not really celebrating my wins. So I'd like reach the thing I'd been working toward for 10 years and be like, okay, what's next? Mm -hmm. Instead of being like, I'm here. What's this like? So I think right now I'm in the, I'm here. What's this like? And there are a lot of potential work and personal opportunities that I'm having conversations with companies about, with people about, and they all excite me, which is good. Um, but I don't really feel like I need to have the answers. I feel like what I need to have is the questions, the questions like, what do I want life to feel like? What really excites me right now? What do I love? What do I want to give to? How do I want to be of service? And then I kind of live my way into the knowing. That is such a beautiful way of looking at it. it instead of needing the answers, you need the questions. And I think that that is, I, I can certainly say that most of the amazing things that I have done with my life were not things that I could possibly have planned. They just happened. And I'm now realizing by virtue of what you're saying, that they happened not because I thought I had any answers, because of course I didn't, but I did have questions. And these, yeah. came to me, these came to me as the answers. And I'm only now am I making that connection. So thank you. You were my, my new... Shaman, shamana, Rachel. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. I mean, if anything has been learned over the last couple of years, it's that we're not in control all the time. Yep. There's a lot that's out of our control. And so sometimes it's actually really freeing to let go of the expectation and see what's already there. There's so much that's right in front of us on a given day that we walk right past because we're expecting to arrive on the other side. Yeah. So I'm kind of just digging, living in the here and here looks different every day, at least in terms of conversations that I get to have opportunities with work opportunities in my personal life. I like that about it. Wow. Beautiful. And, you know, at the outset of this, I said that everybody's lives and lifestyles are as unique as the people themselves. And I, I'm going to extend that statement and say that within everybody's own unique lives and lifestyles, there are many iterations thereof as well. Yeah. Yeah. You get to be you today and you tomorrow can be different and that's okay. Yeah. I had a hard time with that at various points parts of my career where I was like, but wait, I was supposed to be this me. Like I've been working really hard toward that version of me, whether it was, you know, the public presentation of here's who I am as a professional, or it was me doing the inner work or whatever. You is different every day. There are going to be so many variations of you that look forward to meeting you and you don't have to know who they are yet, 
but you also don't have to hold on to versions of you that aren't working. I couldn't possibly ask to end on a better note. So Rachel, this has been an absolutely amazing. How can people find you, connect with you and enter your universe? Hi, welcome to my universe. It's so good to have you. Um, reach out anytime. My handle on social media is Rachel Romes. So that's at R-A-C-H-E-L-R-O-A-M-S. My website is Rachel Romes. You can just look that up, say, hey, drop a note, drop a comment be like, um, hey, I'm growing into my next version of me and it's exciting. Or man, the questions are scary, but isn't this an adventure? And I'll be like, yeah, totally. Let's talk about it. Well, and I can certainly uh, attest to the fact that you are very approachable. Tongue twisted as I was, uh, you made me feel very good. Once I got over myself, uh, you're amazing. You're fabulous. And I'm you so happy too. to know you. You too. You're great at what you do. You show up in spaces, you facilitate conversations, new ideas. It's a beautiful thing. So you make it easy. Well, there you go. See, I think great minds think alike. So we see it in one another. <laughs> we, need, we need that that applause again. You're pretty pretty tiny trumpet. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for joining me today, Rachel. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this interview and you're interested more in the long-term travel lifestyle, I have you covered. There's a checklist in the show notes or description for 10 things you must do before you travel long-term. And trust me, this is going to save you uh, years of strife and bumps up the learning curve that I experienced the hard way that I do not wish on you. So feel free to give that a click while you're there, like the video, mash the button, do the things. And my name is Nora Dunn. I'm otherwise known as the professional hobo, and I'll catch you next time. Thank you.